Hello there, peace be upon you. Welcome to Rational Religion, where we make sense of spirituality. In today's episode of Believe You Me, we're going to be talking about the third way of evolution, said to be fixing all the problems in Neo-Darwinism and rescuing evolution from the um, abyss it currently resides in. <laughs> so what is the third way of evolution? Tell me. So third way of evolution, we, we went to the um, a symposium at the Royal Society some two years ago, mm -hmm. and... Um, what that particularly was about was about looking at the failings of neo-Darwinism and mm. seeing whether there's a kind of third way that's yeah. emerging in the biological literature. And um, what the proponents of the third way of evolution were saying was that actually neo-Darwinism, which is about random mutation and natural selection, if you want to learn more about natural selection and you know random mutation and their inability to uh, produce the complexity of biological life, then check out our previous two videos, which are here or or here. Or in front of us. We're not, we're not that good at these kind of things. Please, please see other YouTubers for that. Absolutely. So anyway, getting back to the point at hand, they were saying that, hey, look, there are all these other new mechanisms of, of biological innovation, mm -hmm. which neo-Darwinism just fails to take into account. Mm -hmm. So one particular um, uh, presentation that was done, which mm -hmm. is really great yeah, science, actually, this particular researcher, she showed that her studies had been looking at two plants, sister plants, genetically identical. Mm -hmm. And one, one plant, call it A, they provided very little water to. Mm -hmm. And the other plant, call it B, okay, they provided plenty of water to. And the progeny of plant A produced, which had very little water given to it, produced really deep roots. And the progeny of plant B produced normal depth of roots. Mm -hmm. And so what they surmised from this was actually that the effect of not giving water to plant A produced a progeny which had um, a, a, some form of you know, biological change, which enabled it to access water more deeply so yeah. that it could grow to a healthy size. That's pretty awesome. Which is a pretty awesome scientific study, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And what they chalked it down to when they looked at the genetics wasn't that it had developed some new genetic mutation, but that it actually just re used its existing genetic information in a new way. It had expressed it in a new way yeah. to enable that gene which promotes root depth penetration they that that gene had been overexpressed compared to plant B. Let's yeah. say. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's characteristic of a lot of these kind of uh, mechanisms which are coming out. Because the the idea is the third, the first way is supposed to be like creationism. The second way is supposed to be neo Darwinism. They think there's a third way where you can have mutations, but they're directed in some way by the organisms themselves. So Jim Shapiro, who um, wrote what is the book called uh, Evolution from the Twenty First Century, I think right near the beginning he talks about how organisms, in his view, are cognitive. They actually have, they can direct change within themselves mm. and they can adapt in, a, in, a, in, in an intelligent way to environmental stresses. Mm. So the classic view is that it's just random variation, like, you know, you're fairer and I'm, we're brothers, you know, you're fairer, I'm darker. You know, maybe that was a random change at the genetic level. Mm. And you have these random changes throughout biological history and then you have some selection pressures on them and it selects for some the other. Mm. What he's saying is that actually, is it possible that the environmental pressures could help direct um, genetic change. Mm. So they've come up with him and sort of many of his colleagues in the area have shown that there are really interesting mechanisms and things that organisms can do where, for instance, if they're undergoing a lot of stress, they have this capacity to, uh, for instance, slightly restructure part of their genome and express new proteins or shuffle it really, really quickly in order to try and generate new, new mutations. Mm. Or they can do the kind of thing that you said. And generally the idea of uh, the third way of evolution is that there's, there are mechanisms out there which aren't necessarily random mutations, but there's ways of producing um, uh, phenotypic change um, which are sort of more adaptive and more cognitive. Mm. Okay, So, I mean, what do we think of that? Do we think that that therefore could be an explanation of how new species arise um, through through this mechanism? I mean, is that is that plausible? Um, it's not. And the reason it's not really is because it's actually just Darwinism on steroids. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're going to say, well, hold on a second, you know, the main problem with neo-Darwinism is that random mutations and, and natural selection can't explain biological complexity. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're then going to add, the, add to the problem by saying that, well, actually, these organisms also have mechanisms for finding the correct mutations. Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself, well, where did that mechanism itself come from? So I went up to this lady at the end of the of her talk about the plants, yeah. and I said, well, you know, that's a really interesting experiment you've done, mm. but there seems to be a problem reaction solution that's going on. Okay. This, this plant, for example, you know, there's a lack of water, therefore I must grow a deeper root structure okay. to access water which lies at deeper levels. Mm -hmm. Now, but one, the plant doesn't know that water lies at deeper levels. On a, on a conscious level. On a conscious level, right. 
The second thing is is that that's a that's some form of a of a biochemical pathway that's going going on there. Mm. The water, the cell is under stress, and it responds by um, promoting those genes which enable a deeper root structure. Now that's an intelligent response, something that the plant, either at a conscious or at a biochemical level, cannot inherently be capable of. And we know right. even if you say on an esoteric level that plants are conscious, well, we're conscious. We can't consciously change yeah. our our gametes. I can't. I can't ask my body to suddenly switch from glucose burning to fat burning and just get rid of all of yeah, the fat or, cells, or affect your your progeny, or affect way. my progeny and and, and 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 effectively regulate the spermatic um, you know mutations. Yeah. It's, it's absurd. So definitely, plants can't do that. So the only way <laughs> is that. There is some kind of cellular process there. That's hardwired. That's that's essentially hardwired. Is this is a stress? Here's the here's the intelligent response to it. Absolutely. Right? So I asked her, where did that process, where did that pathway, where did that hardwiring come from? And she said, um, neo-Darwinism. It came through random mutation. Yeah. So you just actually just added to the problem of neo-Darwinism that neo-Darwinism poses, which is that not only do we have to now find out where mutations came from. Which you know take took as we saw in our previous video more than four billion years. Yeah. Right. Now we have to also ask ourselves where did this this kind of future forward planning come from within the genetic code yeah. that enabled a hardwired response yeah. to a potential environmental stress. I mean, it just boggles the mind. And you can apply that to other mechanisms that are out there. So if they've shown that essentially um, organisms have some kind of inherent capacity to adapt in an interesting and new way. Uh, at a cellular level mm. to various stresses, you have to explain well when did that first arise and what was the mechanism by which that first arise and how did they get hardwired in? Yeah, and it's either ultimately going to go back to was it a directed mechanism or an undirected mechanism because the the type of mech of mutation that you have doesn't really matter. And this is an interesting point I want to actually stop on for a second because people think that mutation and selection is neo Darwinism. It's not. Random mutation and natural selection is neo Darwinism. Mm. So we are, you know, we're theistic. We believe ultimately, which we talk about in another video, that that God directed evolution, right? That there was a designing intelligence that directed things. Yeah. But we don't think that mutation doesn't exist, and the mutation wasn't a potential mechanism, and we don't think that selection pressures didn't apply over evolutionary history. Yeah. The actual difference between neo Darwinism, which is an explicitly atheistic um, paradigm of looking at evolution, and a design perspective, is the random bit. Is yeah. the fact that whatever changes they were. They weren't directed by any kind of conscious and intelligent mind. Mm. Now let's look at the third way of evolution. They're saying that, well, hold on, hold on, stop the presses, guys. There's mutations or types of mutations out there, types of uh, innovation that organisms can do, which seems to be, you know, somehow more intelligent than we previously thought and much more interesting than we previously realised. Well, okay. Well, where does it come from? Does it come from undirected changes or directed changes? There's no third way there. Yeah. It's undirected or, or directed. There's, yeah. there's only two sides of that coin. Yeah. So third way of evolution is actually, as you said, it's restating the problem with much greater severity. Yeah. Because they're not realizing that neo-Darwinism is essentially it's a much bigger thing than uh, than it has to be, you know, point mutations. Absolutely. It's actually a whole way of looking at evolution. And it comes to the crux of, you know, it, it overlaps greatly into really philosophy and, re and religion. Yeah. And this is why I have a part of why evolution is such a contentious topic. It's not like electromagnetism. Yeah. It's not like, um, you know, physical theories of gravity, which, yeah. you know, you're pretty neutral on, uh, you know, theologically. This is talking about where do new things come from? Where does new information in the universe arise? And you can see that from James Shapiro's, you know, in his book, for example, mm -hmm. where he talks about how he believes that organisms can direct their own mutational processes. And they have some kind of either subconscious, unconscious cognitive capacity, capacity yeah. there. Now, He's trying to sneak in intelligent design. Yeah, but the thing is, he's doing it at the dumbest possible level. <laughs> yeah, I know. And the level at which we absolutely know there's zero evidence for it. Yeah. Because we ourselves have the experience yeah. of not being able to do that ourselves. And we can't consciously restructure our... Or unconscious. I mean, we don't know whether... Even if we can do it unconsciously, we it's see not that. as a result of our conscious intelligence. So it has to be also baked into us. Um, that's the problem. Yeah. And um, as a result, you know, what we're actually seeing is we're seeing neo-Darwinism in a cheap tuxedo. Yeah. I'm afraid. OK, that's really interesting, because over the last few videos, what we've done is we looked at neo-Darwinism, supposed to be explaining the appearance of design in the natural world. You look around, it's incredible, it's beautiful. You know, where do these come from? Where do all these traits come from? Darwin said, well, you know what, I think it actually can happen through completely undirected processes of natural variation and natural selection. OK, natural selection can't do anything, really. It can... It can cull things, it can kill things, don't make things, okay? 
Brand new, <laughs> brand new mutation. Also, don't make things. <laughs> Breaks things. <laughs> Third way of evolution. Oh, I've challenged myself now. I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> Third way of evolution. Also, can't actually get you to where you were supposed to be going. Right? It's actually basically still random mutation, but it's just random mutation with more head scratching in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of exhausts all the possibilities. Yeah. So, at a logical level, we show these things can't really work. At an empirical level, they don't work. And ultimately, what we're looking for is an intelligent design process. That is the only thing left. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That yeah. is the only thing left which can possibly explain the observations of nature. And um, as a result, that's actually a philosophical question. That's a question of whether you are willing to accept, mm. as your underlying premise when you study science or nature, that actually there's a very good sound evidence here that there should be um, what Theus would call God, that there should be an intelligent designer. Mm. Now, that's something that's not really even that controversial. I mean, you know, we can pop a video in the link in the description below of Dawkins himself accepting yeah. that aliens could have microengineered yeah. the origin of life. And so he accepted that actually that's a perfectly understandable explanation. The only problem is he doesn't like the idea of God. Yeah. And the ultimate reason why he doesn't like the idea of God has really nothing to do with science. Mm. It's actually got to do with the fact that if you accept the premise that we have been created by an intelligent designer, mm. you then have to look at seriously at the claims of various religions that state that we will be accountable yeah. for our lives, for what we do with our lives, and how we live our lives after death. In other words, it puts constraints on the way you get to live your life. Mm. It limits your freedom in yeah. a sense, certainly a limit of freedom in a certain sense, yeah. um, to being able to do whatever you want. And that's really the crux of this whole discussion. That's really the crux of atheism in general. Atheism is very rarely an objection against God. It's actually an objection at the idea that you're not free to live your life purely how you want to do it. Yeah, that and also an objection against the religions that are presented. Yes, true. And they're, they're, true. they're very related. And often they're degenerated forms and the bad and evil yeah. you know, way in which certain claimants of religiosity behave. There's no yeah. doubt about that. And that's clearly happened in the West over the last few hundred years. You had Absolutely. huge amounts of uh, wars between Catholics and Protestants. And it's currently yeah. happening uh, among Muslims. A lot of people are being put off the pure and beautiful religion of Islam yeah. because of the behaviour of Muslims. But at the end of the day, that's a reason. It's not an excuse. People who are intelligent, as many of the biologists who we've met and spoken to, uh, and even like Richard Dawkins, for example, highly intelligent people otherwise in life, mm. they should have the capacity to be at able to, to at an individual level to be able to be, have the intellectual honesty to say, what does the teaching show? OK, that's not the same as what these religious people are practicing. But also, even before that, at a, bio at, a, at, a, at a biological level, you should be able to quite clearly see, especially these third way people, yeah. that actually, you know, random processes aren't going to cut it. Yeah. So you don't have to become religious in yeah. order to actually accept that design is the really only sufficient explanation of the, of the appearance of design in the world around us. If you want to believe in aliens, the aliens did it, go for it. Yeah, I mean, who produced the aliens, though? Yeah, who produced the aliens? I mean, it's a big, you know, natural, what's it called? Infinite regress. Yeah, but, but actually, you have to have um, intellectual honesty. That's what scientific, that's what being scientific is about. Yeah. Be being scientific doesn't mean I'm going to exclude one possible massive cause of things which people have said throughout human history, yeah. which is that there's some kind of um, being entity out there which is intelligent, which is directing the universe. Mm. Being scientific doesn't mean, OK, I'm going to get rid of that and then only allow myself to focus on everything else. Yeah. Science is about making observations of the universe around them and drawing inferences, with, you know, sound inferences. And if those inferences are telling you that you need an intelligence to produce novelty in the world around you, to produce the appearance of design, then you should accept that. And is that a science stopper? You know, people would say, OK, let's say we accept a design perspective. Then in that case, does that mean there's an end to science because you just say God did it? That's a very good question. And that's a question we're going to be answering in future videos. So thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed these three episodes on neo-Darwinism and related issues. Uh, we'll be covering more topics on evolution in the future. Uh, give us a like, give us a comment, give us some feedback and make sure you subscribe to the channel. We've got lots of different types of videos coming out all the time. We also have a website, rationalreligion.co.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Absolutely. So uh, until next time, and believe you me, peace be upon you. Peace be on you.